Hello, everyone, and I want to welcome you to the God Bless Israel 2020 online conference. And uh, we sure do miss you all at Praise Revival in Davao City. My family has been in the States uh, since March. We left in February to go to Japan for three weeks and ended up coming to the States on March 2nd. And we're hoping to be back in the Philippines by the second week of June, but of course with the coronavirus and everything we've been in the U.S., presently we're in the state of Delaware, and we're going to be going to New York and some other uh, states pretty soon, just traveling as the Lord allows us to have had an opportunity to teach a lot on revival and just share about what God's been doing in the Philippines. And one of the most exciting things to me about what God is doing in the Philippines is God bless Israel. I wholly believe, and I'm going to teach on this today, that in order for us to experience God sending revival and awakening around the world, we're going to have to value Israel the way that God does. And we know that we've had these meetings and gatherings every September and I know that it's it's such a blessing to so many of you. So I want to encourage you to, to stay focused, to participate just as like we were together as a community, and understand that the blessing of the Lord is still being placed upon us, even as we do this by video and recording. So I'm going to pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us today. Jesus, we welcome you. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your power. God, I ask that you would speak to us today. Lord, that you would anoint my words to be able to fall on ears that would hear what your spirit is saying. God, we pray that you give your church in Davao, in Mindanao, and in the Philippines a passion for Israel and understanding of the value that Israel has in the context of your overall plan for the entire world. Jesus, we know that you as a Jewish man came and brought us, many of us who are Gentile, into your kingdom through your shed blood. And because of that, Lord, we can believe you to pour out your spirit upon Israel and upon the nations. So God, that's why we're here today. We're praying for revival in Israel amongst your people, revival in the nations, God, so that your great commission can be completed and Jesus can return and do all that you have in your heart to do for for all of eternity. God, what an honor it is to know you and to love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to get right into this today. I want to talk to you today about revival alignment. Revival alignment. And what it, what is a car alignment? I'm sure many of you, anybody who's ever owned a vehicle, you understand that not only do you need to get the oil changed every so often and, you know, uh, fill the car with gas, but one thing you have to do is get an alignment for your car. Let me explain what an alignment is. Alignment is the adjustment of the vehicle suspension system. The suspension can connects the vehicle to the wheels. And when the wheels are properly aligned with the suspension, the tires will not have abnormal wear from being out of balance. So if the suspension of the vehicle is not connected to the wheels properly, and if the tires on the wheels are, you know, and it's all out of balance, it's going to cause wear and tear on the tires that is not normal wear and tear. It's abnormal. It's sometimes your tires can wear off in certain areas and you don't even realize it. And you notice the car pulling you in a certain direction while you're just trying to stay straight on the road. And it's, let's assume that it has nothing to do with the air pressure in the tire. Now all the tires are full of air. But if there's abnormal wear on the tires from being out of alignment with the suspension system, 
it causes the vehicle to veer to the right or to the left, and it causes the wear on the tire to increase more than what is necessary. So you should be able to see a PowerPoint here, and along with that, some of the definitions and pictures that I'll be sharing along with the points as well. But you see on the left, there's the wearing of a bad tire that that well of a bad alignment I should say and and you know when this tire this vehicle was out of alignment it caused the 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 tread in the tires to go bald quicker and that's very dangerous if you don't have thick tread on your tires obviously like we've been saying it's going to pull you to the left to the right and then you see on the right a, a normal tire that doesn't have tremendous wearing and, and it has good alignment. You know, you could have a brand new tire and if it's not aligned, it's going to veer to the left to the right eventually. It may not happen right away, but eventually it will. And you know, when we get born again, God is the suspension system. You know, we are the wheels and the tires are the ministry that we have that if we focus and we align with God the way that he desires to, if we stay connected to him, if we stay aligned with God, then our, our, the tread on our tires, you know, the ministry that God has called us to in the church is going to be effective. It's not going to pull to the left or to the right. It's going to stay focused on the purposes of God and what he has planned. Alignment in the church takes place after we personally align with Jesus. When hearts are aligned with God, he aligns us with his purposes. God's plan, the great commission, is to make disciples of all men. God said we do this by focusing on the Jew first and then to the Gentile. If we do not focus on doing things through God's plan and God's purpose, we're not lining up with God. But when personal revival takes place in our hearts and we follow the Holy Spirit and the leading of God's word, God is going to actually help us to fulfill his perfect plan and will that he has not only for our lives, but is for his church, for the Gentile, and for the Jew. And we understand that the Great Commission is God's call. It's what Jesus gave after he rose from the dead for us to go make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. And in Romans 1, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but in Romans 1, it talks about that the gospel is to the Jew first and then the Gentile. If we do not follow God's direction and God's plan for fulfilling the Great Commission, we can be out of alignment with God. And when we're out of alignment with God, we're not going to go in a direction that he wants us to go. And, you know, there's a lot of things that can derail us and, and get us out of alignment with God. You know, we could not be, you know, pressing into God personally. You know, we could be lackadaisical in our prayer lives, in the reading, in a meditation of God's word. We could be, you know, having offense in our hearts towards brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, we, we could be, you know, allowing our dreams and our visions uh, to have more importance to us than the purposes and plans of God. And so what I want us to see today is that it's extremely biblical for when we are aligned with God in personal revival for us to hear the voice of God, to know his heart for Israel. And if we do not have the mind of Christ when it comes to Israel, we're absolutely missing out on fulfilling the overall purpose and plan of God for the nations. So revival is the continual process throughout history where God interrupts the church's straying so that we can be realigned with God and stay focused on fulfilling his overall plans. If you see that next slide, you see the, the ringing of a telephone. And I believe that God is always speaking. 
that God is always wanting us to get our attention. And oftentimes we get so busy in life, you know, making sure that we're fed and we're working and taking care of family and even ministry and church responsibilities. And these are all important things. But if we lose our intimacy with God, we can easily get out of alignment with him, which means that if we are moving forward in life without being connected to God individually and personally, we're actually, no matter how good our intentions are, we're fulfilled. We might be on the road to fulfilling the plans of God, but if we're out of alignment with him, we're going to start veering to the left and to the right. And I, if, if you're like me, you really appreciate, you know, the grace of God for our lives because without Jesus, without the power of the Holy Spirit, none of us are ever going to be good enough to just fulfill all that God wants us to do unless we're walking in humility and, and obviously personal revival. I believe it's extremely important. And I, and I believe God is constantly calling us, trying to interrupt our lives, saying, hey, Get back on the track. Get back in right alignment with me. Stay focused. Do what I've called you to do. I, I believe that many uh, churches today are not fulfilling God's purposes and plans, not because they don't have good theology or doctrine all the time. As much as it is, they have their own ideologies. We have you know, we've, what we've learned from others, what we think is right instead of allowing God's word and his presence to determine what direction and focus we should have to fulfill his plans. So why do we need revival alignment? Now, this is kind of a summary of Romans 9, 10, and 11. I would encourage you to read those chapters on your own, which I'm sure you're going to be hearing taught about during this entire conference. But it was a sin, or let's say the pothole of Adam and Eve that destroyed man's alignment with God. You know, if you're, one of the things that can throw off alignment is when, when you're driving a car, is if you hit a pothole in the road. And it can really, you know, knock the tire out of balance and, and cause you to, uh, you know, your tire to be leading the whole entire vehicle off the direction where you need to go. And so the sin of Adam and Eve caused us to get out of alignment with God. And, and it's just like a car being out of alignment. Mankind, if we, again, get out of revival alignment with God, we're going to miss the long-term purposes and goals of what God has to do in fulfilling the Great Commission. Without Israel being chosen, the world could never be aligned with God. So in the in the wisdom of God after Adam and Eve sinned and God raised up, you know, the prophets and and uh even let's let's start with Abraham when he chose Abraham, he said all nations will be blessed through you. God chose Israel not because he didn't love anybody else out of all the other nations in the world, but he chose Israel as a starting place of how he can redeem the world from sin and be so that we can be reconciled to God the Father. And we know that Jesus came forth as a Jew to fulfill God's covenant promises to Israel. And so if if Jesus was a Gentile and, and God had chosen Israel, he could not have fulfilled all the covenant purposes that God had planned for Israel. But he had to be a Jew. And, and because Jesus was Jewish and all the early disciples and uh, almost everyone in the beginning of the book of Acts, right? We read about the gospel was for the Jew first. And we're going to get more into that in a moment. But Jesus came to realign the world as through his blood he saves us, whether we be Jew or Gentile, and his plan and purpose we're continuing to talk about. God uh, did not make up replacement theology. Replacement theology, as I'm sure uh, many of you know, is a lot of people believe the church replaces Israel as God's chosen people. Now, there's no scripture in the Bible that says that. 
And if God does not keep his covenant promises to Israel, then you and I as Gentiles cannot believe for the purposes of God to be fulfilled. God is a God of alignment. God is a God that when he says something, he fulfills his promises. He sticks to what he says. He's not going to leave Israel. He says, I, I, I've inscribed you on the palm of my hands. He's talking about Israel. He, he loves Israel. And even though Israel has sinned and, and all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, God sent his only begotten son so that we could be redeemed and brought back in right relationship. But he keeps his promises to Israel. Uh, replacement theology keeps man out of revival alignment with God. The great commission to the Jew first is God's revival alignment plan. Since Israel resisted, God uses Gentiles, used the Gentiles to continue this revival alignment. Now, if you read on in Romans 9, 10, and 11, you'll see that because Paul is saying that because Israel has largely, not all of them, has largely uh, not accepted Jesus as the Messiah, Paul was chosen by God as a Jew to go to the Gentiles. And as he began to minister to Gentiles, many Gentiles started coming to the Lord. And, you know, that's why we're talking about this here in the Philippines today, because the majority of Filipinos are Gentile, just like I am. I'm an American. And, and the gospel has gone around the world mostly through Gentiles. But the purpose of uh, the beginning, the foundation before Gentiles were brought in, the gospel went to the Jew first. And in Romans, it tells us that we are grafted in to Messiah Jesus. Jesus makes Jew and Gentile one. He tears down the middle wall of separation. And so just when you think, well, if the Jews don't accept Jesus as Messiah, that this whole thing is, is not going to work and God has failed, God has a plan by using a Jewish man and Paul the Apostle to win Gentiles uh, to Jesus and make disciples of them, and their purpose, as the purpose should be to all the church for the last 2,000 years, should be to make Israel jealous, because we know in the culmination of all things, before the return of Jesus, that there will be a great revival amongst the Jewish people, and that will be largely because of the Gentile church making Israel jealous, that we have received Jesus as Messiah, and now you are seeing that he is who he says he is. He is a God of covenant promises. He's not, you know, forgotten Israel, but in all these years, through all the hardships, through the persecutions, through the Holocaust, through the hatred, through all the anti-Semitism, God has kept his people alive, and, and God has continued to cause his word to start in Jerusalem and one day it'll finish in Jerusalem. So Romans 1 16, this is the key verse for Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And here's the key first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. If the great commission of any church does not prioritize the salvation of Israel, we're making disciples without aligning ourselves with God's plan and blessing. If you see on the um, on the PowerPoint here, the slide, you see a car, it says when, when, when the car was pulling, it's pushing its brake, that it was pulling to the left. And now if your tire is out of alignment and you're driving a car, on the highway, on the road, and then you hit the brake, that tire that is out of alignment is going to cause your car to, to veer to the left if, if that you know tire is out of alignment or tires are out of alignment. And I believe the church is just like this car. And when you get in a car, you have a destination of where you want to go. If you get in your car and you say, I want to go to the mall, to a restaurant, or to school, or to church, or something, you have a destination mind where you're going. The Great Commission 
is the vehicle that God's asked us to get into to fulfill his purposes and plans for the nations. But if we are out of alignment with God, and especially if our theology is not right, we believe as a church, we replace Israel, we may be saved, we may be born again, we may even be filled with the Holy Ghost and going to church and doing all kinds of good deeds. But if we don't see Israel the way that God wants us to see Israel, we're going to be in the long run veering to the left or to the right. And we're getting out of alignment with the plan, overall plan of God that is going to, uh, you know, overlook God's blessing and purposes for Israel. So why do we need revival alignment? Well, you know, cars that are driven out of alignment uh, cause more personal problems and crashes. I mean, if your tires are not safe, if your wheels are out of alignment, if if you're not in connection with that suspension system, uh, your vehicle's not, you're going to be setting yourself up for a crash. And so that's why we gotta we gotta live a a a, a balanced understanding of our relationship with God and God's purposes for Israel. If we don't as a church, we are in danger of crashing because we can't do things our way. We either submit to the purposes and plans of God or we don't. And we can't have part of the gospel and then say, well, we replace Israel and we're going to do things uh, our way. There's a better way. We can't do it that way because God has promised that he's never going to forget Israel. Replacement theology in a church is like driving without a good alignment. Replacement theology resists God's revival alignment interruptions. We don't pay attention to God when he's trying to give us his heart for Israel. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, we, we've got to love his people. And you, you think, Eric, you're echoing, you're, you're, you're saying the same thing over and over because I don't feel like a lot of churches and pastors and ministers are prioritizing ministries or not prioritizing Israel in what God has called us to do. We think, oh, I'm just going to go, you know, feed the poor and heal the sick and cast out devils and raise the dead. That's, of course, what we're supposed to do. We're to do the things that Jesus did. But what did Jesus do? He went to the Jew first. And if we don't know how to do that, or we don't understand how that's going to happen when we li live in the midst of many Gentiles, then we're not pursuing it. And we're just hoping that it's just... You know, God's just going to cause Jews all over the world to be born again. Listen, unless the church prays, unless the church goes, unless the church gives and understands the root from where we came from, we are missing out on fulfilling the plan of God for the ages. Now, without Israel being honored by the local church, we will not fulfill God's overall plan, no matter how good our intentions are. Because again, there's there's not two roads to fulfilling God's kingdom purposes. There's just one. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets to the Father but through me. We have to do things. And you know, uh, uh, a lot of times, if you've ever been on a road that's really windy and turning and stuff, you know, if you don't pay attention, you know, you can you can crash easily because life is not just a, a straight highway all the time where you could just kind of sit back, relax and drive along. It's full of many bumps in the roads. roads. It's full of, you know, potholes. It's full, you know, landslide. You got to watch for all kinds of things that are happening. And if we as a church just get focused on you know, doing our thing in our church, but we don't have a burden to pray and we don't have a burden to, to do whatever we possibly can. And you say, well, what can I do, Eric? How can I, you know, attribute to the salvation of Israel? Friend, first of all, walk in personal revival. And then after that, ask the Holy Spirit and say, God, what can I do? What can we do as a church so that we can make an, an impact to see all Israel must be saved? As revival alignment happens in us, in the church, breakthroughs happen around the world. You know, I, I believe that this whole coronavirus thing, it's amazing how it shut down most of the world um, quicker 
than anything we've ever seen. All of the world. I mean, flights, you know, uh, everything's changed. We're stuck here in the U.S. and uh, nations, people can't work. And people have been, you know, from understanding, Davao, you were quarantined to your homes. Lockdown is probably the better word. And it's been hard. Because of a virus, and and the crazy thing to me is that this virus has a 98% recovery rate. It's not even as bad as other flus, and and it's bad because people die. I'm not saying it's not real. Obviously, if you have a compromised immune system or you're elderly, you you need to pay attention to it. However, we as the church have to understand that if the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy through a virus that could shut down the world, then if we get in alignment with God personally and corporately as the body of Christ, and we begin to pray and believe for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to be upon Jew and Gentile, that God will do something even greater. I'm believing for worldwide revival. I'm believing for a national awakening in America and in the Philippines, uh, all over the world, because I don't believe the enemy is going to have the upper hand. And when we line up with God's plans, he will pour out his spirit upon Israel and upon all nations. Hallelujah. Praise God. Listen, as long as the church overlooks the priority of evangelism, the gospel to the Jew first, we inadvertently delay the return of the Lord by neglecting the very ones who he is waiting for. To welcome him back. Scott Volk said that. My good buddy Scott. And if you see the signs here. Of uh, street clothes. Do not enter. Detour. You know that's what replacement theology does. There's a right way to go. In the purposes and plans of God. By being in alignment. And believing God. For all of Israel to be saved. Or there's a wrong way. There's a detour. And that's the church replaces Israel. As God's chosen people. And again, we could be doing all the right things, but if we don't value what is important to God, we're actually holding back the hand of God. We're delaying the purposes of God from being fulfilled in our day. Matthew 23, 39, Jesus said, For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He was speaking to the Jews. The Jews have to welcome Jesus back in order for him to come back. And that's when he's going to return. And it might seem like a a far off thing, but friend, we've seen how a virus can shake the nations. God is so much more powerful than a virus. God is so much more powerful than governments. God can do anything. It doesn't matter who the elected officials, officials are in any country. If the church of Jesus Christ will be in revival alignment with him, then we will, and we pray for Israel. I'm telling you, God's going to pour out his spirit quicker than we think. We need God's blessing to fulfill God's plan. You know, ever since our ministry, the last several years in the Philippines, we lived in the Philippines for 17 years, has prioritized Israel in the Great Commission. Our ministry has been blessed and expanded. You know, we have a lot of things going on. We have fire school ministry. Uh, you know, which has been such a blessing. We love our students and graduates. We have a feeding program, we feed over 100 kids every week, been doing that for over 10 years. You know, we have a house of prayer. We have uh, multiple churches we're connected to, you know, Maranatha, Praise Revival, Pastor Lagat's church, Ken Samber, all these, you know, friends and Pastor Hurley, everybody there. There's so many amazing churches and leaders that God's connected us to. We've been able to travel and preach around the Philippines and the nations. And a lot of this has to do because I remember in prayer one day, I said, Lord, what does this scripture in Romans mean? The gospels to the Jew first and to the Gentile. We pray for Israel. I've been under Dr. Michael Brown's ministry for over 20 plus years. And it's not like we don't love Israel, but how, I asked God this. I said, how can I as a Gentile believer living and ministering in a nation full of Gentiles, take the gospel to the Jew first. And I began to pray for Israel more than I ever had before. And within a year, I ended up meeting Pastor Al, becoming a part of uh, God Bless Israel. We ended up 
And many of you remember Liel, the young lady from Israel who came and uh, actually lived with our family for some months and came to the Lord. And, uh, uh, and you know, we, we ended up going to Israel. We ended up, uh, Casey and I did, we ended up having Paul Wilbur come and, and do a concert in Davao. And, and then Dr. Michael Brown and Scott Vol came and ministered. And, and I look at all and I'm like, wow. And, and not only that, but the thousands of dollars that had to come in for all this stuff to take place. I'm telling you, I've raised money for children. I've raised money for the poor. I've raised money for all kinds of, of missions, endeavors. But when you focus on Israel, you're focusing on God's heart more than anything. Not because he loves them more than anybody else, but simply because we're getting in alignment with God and he's beginning to cause his blessing to be poured out upon us. You see the little chart on this slide here. It says curse and blessing and Israel from the start of time. And then the yellow line, Jesus, we all, uh, you know, Jesus came and reconciled us to the Father. And then in Jesus, you know, uh, Gentiles are grafted in uh, to Israel, and now we move forward. Uh, I just believe exactly what Genesis 12, 3 says. I will bless those who bless you. Speaking of Israel, God speaking to Abraham about Israel. And whoever curses you, Israel, I will curse, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. God has not changed his plans and purposes. He will fulfill the desires of his heart. We have to be in revival alignment with him. We have to pray and focus on Israel in our ministries. I don't care if you're in children's church pastor or you're the worship leader or you're the guy who, an usher, a greeter. Man, it, whatever we do, a missionary to what whatever types of ministry God's called us to, we have to have God's plan and purpose in our minds as a part of the great commission to reach Israel. We have to see that and prioritize it and it will change anything and add God's uh, blessing upon our lives so that we can uh, see him involved not only in what we do, but taking over what we do. Hallelujah. So, in Ruth 2, 1 through 23, I just want to go through this scripture passage quickly. It's an example of revival alignment. You see God pouring out his blessing, his covenant promises on Israel and the little graph and how Israel, you know, uh, from them, the gospel went to the nations. So in this chapter, Ruth represents Gentiles and Boaz represents Israel. Now you remember that Ruth, was a Gentile. She's a Moabite. And she was married to a Jewish man. And her husband died along with her father-in-law who died and her brother-in-law who, who uh, also died. And uh, she told Naomi, her mother, look, I'm not going to leave you. Who's, who's a Jew? I'm going to go with you. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. So she made a commitment to Naomi that I'm going to be with you. And that's in Ruth 1. But let's get into Ruth chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go into the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So, you know, she was, she already aligned herself with the God of Israel by being committed to Naomi, a Jew committed to, a Gentile committed to a Jew, right? And she says, I'm going to make sure we got enough food. I'm going to go work and do whatever's necessary. Friend, if you want God to bless your life, your finances, your children, whatever you put your hands to, man, get in alignment with God and he will bless you. And, and it says, and, and Ruth says, uh, you know, go ahead, my daughter. Verse three. So she went out, entered the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. The other harvesters were, were Jews. So she felt probably a little bit out of place being 
uh, you know, from Moab. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech, her father-in-law. And so uh, they were from the distant, distant, you know, uh, relatives. Um, but she was, of course, married in. And she just so happened to be working in Boaz field. You know, when you set your heart on aligning yourself with God and his purposes and plans for Israel, you know what happens? You begin to see the hand of God work things out for you that you never would have seen unless you made them uh, your priority. Verse four, just as Boaz arrived from, uh, arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, everybody would answer him. And Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young lady, young woman belong to? Because she was, she may have looked different. You know, she was a Moabitess. Verse six, the overseer replied, she's a Moabite. Came back from Moab with Naomi. She grafted in. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from the morning till now, except for a short rest and a shelter. So Boaz, verse eight, said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Do not glean in another field or, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the woman who, with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay their hand on you. And wherever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. In other words, Boaz is saying to Ruth, listen, you don't have to go anywhere. You're grafted into our family. You're a part of our family. You receive the same blessing as the other women. My field is your field. And, and stay with the ladies. They're going to help you around. Um, nobody's going to lay a hand on you because you are under my authority. There's a powerful authority. Jesus grafted us in through his blood that we are a part of the family of God. We're not outcasts. We're not unimportant if you're a Gentile. But you've got to see the plan and purpose of God, you know, for honoring and valuing Israel. Because if we don't, we're going to miss out on the blessing of the Lord to take care of us even when we don't even know what to expect. Verse 10, at this, she bowed her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you've noticed me a foreigner? Gentiles are essentially foreigners because we were outside God's covenant with Israel. But again, through the blood of Jesus, he brings us in so that we're no longer foreigners, but citizens seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're citizens of heaven now. Verse 11, Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord for the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Hallelujah. Oh, this is good, friends. The church has to learn how to take refuge under the God of, uh, under the wings of the God of Israel. There's no other God. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you and I being grafted into that, I want to tell you, he is going to bless you the same way he would do any Jewish person who's ex understood Jesus as Messiah. Verse 13 May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Imagine if, if Ruth stood up and said, you know what? I don't believe that your family really cares about me. And I believe, uh, you know, even though I came back to, to Israel with um, Naomi, I'm, I'm going to start my own way of doing things. I'm going to start my own family. At this point, she was probably a little bit older. You know, she lost her husband probably at a young age. And, and she's, you know, starting something all over that she doesn't need to start all over. And, you know, she could have totally dishonored the Lord, Naomi, her family by saying, I'm just going to go and do things my way. 
And, and what am I saying? I'm saying that we as a church, that's what we do when we believe in replacement theology, is that we're saying there's, there's another way. There's another, uh, you know, way that we could be blessed and walk in this life. And I want to tell you, God's merciful and graceful. And I believe he even, you know, takes care and, and people can be saved who believe in replacement theology. But I believe in the long run, being out of alignment with God is going to, you know, cause us to be insensitive to God's purposes for Israel and, and drive us away from his plan in years to come before the return of Jesus. Boaz, Boaz say uh, in verse 14, uh, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine and vinegar. You're a part of us, man. When she sat down with the harvester, she offered some uh, roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over, friend. That's the kind of blessing we want to be under, amen? As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. She, uh, she's not a Jew, but she's grafted into us. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. I guess that's how you say that. <laughs> Verse 18, she carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law said, saw how much she had gathered. Ruth brought it out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Can you imagine? I mean, these folks were, were poor. They were struggling. They had lost their husbands. Uh, life been hard. They had to go undergo a huge move back home. And now she's gleaning in the field because they didn't have enough money. But now she goes there and she aligns herself with her family. And then what happens? She gets super blessed. Verse 19, her mother-in-law asked, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. I'm sure Naomi's eyes lit up. She probably recognized his name. She says in verse 20, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemer. In other versions, it says kinsmen redeemers. Oh, my friend, I'm telling you, that's who Jesus is to you and me. He's our kinsman redeemer. His blood is enough to wash us and get us into revival alignment with him and so that we can fulfill all the plans that he knows that he has for each and every one of us. Verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work with, for him because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. In someone else's field, you might be harmed. This is the danger of replacement theology. It's being out of a bad alignment, you know, with God. And, and it's, you know, again, we might be on the path. We might be on the right road but we're veering to the left or to the right and we don't know that destruction is up ahead. Stay in the right field, my friend. Bless the people of God and choose to let God's purposes be fulfilled through your life. The last verse. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. We know eventually that uh, Ruth and Boaz get married which is spectacular, and then through their line comes Messiah Jesus. Hallelujah. That's some good news right there. Listen, Keith Collins said this the other day. I was going back and forth when I wrote it down. He said, when the church divorces its role regarding Israel, then we cease to fulfill God's ultimate role for us, and as a result, the purposes of God for Israel and the church become interlocked in a negative way and the eschatological timeline is impacted. That means if we don't align ourselves with God today, if the church doesn't align itself with uh, 
the great commission purposes that Jesus had in mind, the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, we can add a negative connotation to the return of Jesus. We can get in the way of what God wants to do. Friend, I don't want to get in God's way. I want to do things God's way. Because if we do things his way, then the gospel will be preached to the nations and all Israel, and then Jesus will return. So we need God's blessing to fulfill God's plans. If revival is to take place, then the church must become aligned with God's overall passion to see Israel saved. Only then will the Great Commission be fulfilled. The gospel started in Jerusalem, and it has always gone to the west, and it's coming back around, and it's going to end in Jerusalem. Let me ask you a question today. Are you aligned rightly with God? Is there any sin that's separating you from, from Jesus? My friend, there's forgiveness today. There's mercy today. Don't be offended with people. You know, don't live with bitterness and rage and anger in your life. It knocks us out of alignment with God. And, and today, I'll, I'll, we want to give you an opportunity to get right with Jesus. Because that's where it all begins. And as you get right with God, let me ask you this next question. Are you, gonna, are you fulfilling His great commission to the Jew first, then to the Gentile? I didn't even know how to do that. But I prayed, and the Lord started to open up all these phenomenal doors for us, as I told you before. And I've seen a blessing upon our lives, upon my children. My daughter gets a full scholarship to a, a university that costs $18,000 a year. Well, it's uh, over about $100,000 that it would, it would cost her to go to that university in four years. She's going for free. I look at that as us aligning ourselves with God. Personal revival alignment is where we got to begin today. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Are you ready? Are you ready to meet Jesus today? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each and every one listening and watching today. God, I pray that we would be in revival alignment with you, that you would forgive us of our sin. Lord, that you cause us to be recognizing that the blood that you shed was actually Jewish blood. Because your blood forgives us, not only of our sin, but aligns us with your purposes and plans. We want to fulfill the Great Commission, the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. Lord, I ask if anyone here today needs to repent and get right with you, that they would Pray a prayer of salvation today from their own heart, repenting from sin and asking Jesus into their heart. Lord, we thank you. I pray for PRC, uh, Praise Revival Church, and all the churches and pastors and leaders and uh, people watching this video. And I ask God that you pour out your blessing upon their lives as they align themselves with you and your purposes for Israel. Thank you, God for allowing us to be grafted in and be a part of this end time harvest before the second coming of Jesus. We want to be a part of that group that says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. We love you and we miss you and we can't wait to see you all soon. God bless.